Good morning. It's good to see you guys. It's good to see your smiling faces, with or without masks. It's good to see it. You can see it kind of creeping up around. Um, I want to direct your attention this morning to something that I personally have wrestled through in different moments of my life, and it's this area of loneliness. See, in 2018, the United Kingdom made international headlines when the Prime Minister appointed this, the country's first Minister for Loneliness. According to the report from the previous year, an estimated 9 million of the country's 67 million people felt lonely, some or all the time. That comes out to about 14% of the British population. And the purpose for creating this new ministerial head was to lead this cross-government group to address the presence of loneliness in the nation and make that issue a consistent priority for Parliament. Now, the UK is not the only country that's recently concerned itself with caring for its lonely citizens. In 2017, the former U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, called loneliness a growing health epidemic. Murthy even pointed to a study that claimed social isolation was associated with a reduction in lifespan similar to that of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And as I dug deeper into this loneliness epidemic, I found that loneliness is a, it's a pervasive problem that is throughout all the societies of the world. And although you may not consider yourself to be a lonely person struggling with loneliness often, All of us can admit that at some point in our lives we experience loneliness. Whether it's missing out on an event due to sickness. I remember one time when it was Thanksgiving and I was sick as a dog and everybody else was gathering around the table enjoying the turkey and I was relegated to my room hearing the joy, hearing them smack their lips over the turkey. (laughs) It was lonely. Or maybe you miss the, the company of a, of a loved one who's passed away, who you spent so much of your time with. Loneliness affects every generation. High school, college students, loneliness hits them in a unique way now. Like As they're going through and scrolling through Instagram and social media accounts, they, they find that their lonely experiences are heightened. They're they're coaxed on as if they're persuaded to believe that they've been excluded from the fun that everybody else is having. Certain seasons of life, like singleness or moving or starting a new job or losing a job or going to a new school, they, they make us more susceptible of feeling that we lack the relationships that we think we're supposed to have. And, and young parents, of course, can feel isolated in a valley of diapers. <laughs> From, from not being around other adults and just being emotionally exhausted for having to constantly use vocabulary that's like a three-year-old. And of course, more recently, social distancing and closures have forced many of us to wrestle with this, to wrestle with not being around our closest companions on a day-to-day basis. And all of us can agree with our Creator in light of these things in Genesis 2.18 that it is not good that man should be alone. And yet we have to continually grapple with the anguish of loneliness ever since Adam's fall. So what is loneliness? I keep saying it. Well, one helpful definition by a guy named Jason Gabbery is loneliness is the gap between the social connectedness that you feel and the social connectedness that you want to feel. Simply by pondering this definition for just a minute, minute, it becomes evident that loneliness doesn't discriminate. It's It's in people of every age, every gender, every class, every race, every marital status and education level. You can be married and feel disconnected. You can be at the top of your company, the heights of your career, and feel like you're the only one there. You could be in a huge crowd and feel utterly alone. But the good news is that the Scripture gives us the only real remedy for our loneliness and provides the one true and effective minister for our loneliness, God himself. He has the power to transform even the loneliest of moments into solitude where we enjoy the deepest social connection imaginable, fellowship with the creator of the universe. 
And in order to press into this longing this morning that we experience in our life, I want us to look at Psalm 142. One of my favorite psalms in all of the Bible. I pray that as we look at David's prayer this morning, we might be thoroughly convinced and changed by the truth that God is with us and he works in us through our loneliness. Will you pray with me? Father God, I pray that as we dive into your word, your holy word, the truth that you reveal to us for our good and for our sanctification, God, that we might see you as ever-present in our loneliness, ever-present in our lives, guiding us, encouraging us, comforting us. I pray that you would use these words to be a balm for our souls that we can take with us whenever this idea of loneliness kind of creeps in and we feel it. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So before we dive into the main portion of the text today, I want, I want you to look at the Spirit-inspired heading of Psalm 142. Too often we quickly just skip over these things, right? You just, okay, fine, thanks for the instructions to the musical, like, you know, um, con- congregation. No, 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 they're actually in the text. The Holy Spirit actually inspired these words, and they explain the type of psalm, the author, and even the setting or situation of the psalm. So in this case, we see that Psalm 142 is both a masculine and a prayer of David. David, the youngest son of Jesse, right? The guy who was anointed to be king by Samuel. The one who, with a couple stones and a slingshot, brought that Philistine Goliath down to his knees and defeated the entire Philistine army. This man who's described as being a man after God's own heart, he writes these words both as a supplication and a prayer to the Lord. Also what's called a mascal. We aren't entirely certain what a mascal referred to in ancient Israel, but scholars tend to narrow it down to either a, a form of musical instruction or referring to the manner of a psalm's performance. Perhaps it's both. I'm not sure. But... The main piece of information I want us to grab a hold of is what it says about David. It was when he was in a cave. Now we know of two instances in which David was confined to a cave. One was at Adullam, 1 Samuel 22, and the other at a place called En Gedi, 1 Samuel 24. I believe that the cave in view here is the one at Adullam. Because if you look at the events leading up to this moment in 1 Samuel, Samuel 20 and 21, you can see the desperate and lonely situation that David finds himself in after saying goodbye to his dearest of friends, Jonathan. And then now he's on the run from Jonathan's dad, King Saul, who's trying to kill him. David fled to the city of Nob and then to Gath and then to Adullam. When he got to Nob, Ahimelech, the priest, meets him and he says, he asks him this question. He says, why are you alone and no one with you? And then out of fear of Achish, the king of Gath, David, he pretends to be insane in order to get away from the Philistines. To the point of just having like spit just roll down his beard like a crazy person. These are the events that lead up to his escape to the cave of Adullam, where eventually his, his brothers and his family and up to 400 people gather around him. And I believe the inspiration behind the words of Psalm 142, are birthed while David is alone in this cave, waiting for those people to gather around him. In fact, I would even say that God planned these hardships and these difficulties that David trudges through to invite him into a deeper relationship with himself. So as we dive into Psalm 142 this morning, with that context in mind, I want us to focus on two truths that I've already mentioned, but let me make them more clear. One, that God is with us in our loneliness. And we'll see that in verses 1 through 4. And then God works in us when we are alone. Verses 5 through 7. First, God is with us in our loneliness. See, as you grow in your knowledge of the Trinitarian God, His attributes, they become a constant remedy for your soul. The underlying motivation behind these pleas from David in verses 1 through 4, they're rooted in in God's omniscience, in God's omnipresence. The fact that he knows everything and he is everywhere. There are three principles that come to bear on us as we meditate about these attributes in this prayer. And they're really simple, but sometimes we just need to pound it into our head that this is true, that God hears you, that God knows you, and that God sees you. God hears you. 
When reading the Psalms, or any biblical passage for that matter, it's important that we observe the words repeated by the author. So let's look at verses 1 through 2. It says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before Him. I tell my trouble before Him. We see here at the very beginning, with my voice, with my voice. He says that twice. These words indicate it's an audible prayer. It's, it's not just David thinking to himself, doing these silent prayers, being satisfied with mere mental contemplation. He shouts it out. His mouth is open. It's bold. It's loud. He's not worried about being heard by any human, or for that matter, he's not worried about the snakes or the spiders or the bears that might be in this cave. He's already killed bears and lions, right, when he was a shepherd. He's not worried about that. The intensity of David's internal distress is so great that he's only worried about getting God's attention. His pleads for mercy from the only one who can actually give mercy, the Lord God Almighty. Then we see another repetition here. To the Lord, to the Lord. The one to whom David addresses is the Lord God Almighty. What David wants is divine intervention to be delivered from his enemies. He is by himself, hiding in this cave. But with one more repetition, he emphasizes that the ultimate reality of his current location is before God, before him, before him. He's in the presence of the only true God, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the only right display of his reverence in this moment, being before the holy God of the universe, is to lament to cry out, to share his complaint and his trouble with the God who is there. See, the reason why that's true is because God delights in his children pouring out their hearts to him. We see this in the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19. After this prophet bore witness to the power of God at, the, at Mount Carmel with those prophets of Baal and all of them were slaughtered and destroyed, where do we see him? Lodging in a cave by himself, dejected, alone. And similarly, he's fleeing his enemies, namely that wicked queen Jezebel. And twice, God goes to Elijah and asks him a question. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? I've been very jealous, he answers, for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have, who have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. The Lord knew what had transpired, but he was drawing it out of Elijah to vocalize it, to say it. He encourages the prophet to give utterance to what is troubling his soul. When I see my children visibly distressed, and something is going wrong, I don't want them to keep it to themselves. I want them to tell me what it is that pains them, to tell me what's wrong. And in this psalm, David is telling his father what's wrong. And of course, God already knows, because God knows you. God knows you. For many of us, the past four months of social distancing, they've, they've drained us of much of the vitality we possessed before COVID-19. Most of us would be slow to say that we've been flourishing in the past four months. Many of you might be moving from different degrees of exhaustion due to uncertainties about tomorrow, not just being able to plan like normal, or just the struggles of today are really intense. You might feel like no one knows what you're going through. And though you may lament your current season, you can have confidence in the omniscience of God. He knows all of your course of life. David's words in verse 3 here reveal a greater reality than our own subjective experience, than what he was experiencing in the cave. He continues in prayer. When my spirit faints within me, you know my way. In the path where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. See, David's spirit was failing him. Literally his Experience is described in the text as his spirit darkening within him. He's overwhelmed like a man who can barely see in front of him because of the, the thick clouds of darkness are just looming overhead. Loneliness can be so pronounced and so thick that you can't even think to cut through it. 
It's so heavy that you can't even lift it up. And David's disposition was not random. He didn't bring it upon himself. He wasn't like, I'm going to be lonely today. I feel like doing that. No, it was in response to the actions of others. The cause of his faint-heartedness is the hidden traps laid for him. And we're not entirely sure what these hidden traps were, but we know that they were designed to destroy him, to defeat David. And these hostile designs, they discourage David. And they are to blame for him being downtrodden and taking up residence in this cave. But despite his exhaustion and his enemy's traps, see this, guys, David exclaims to God, you know my way. You know my way. And what's really cool, in the text, the emphasis here is on the pronoun you. It's just kind of like saying, this is the point. You, God, know me. You know my way. You have intimate omniscience of everything that's going on. Everything around me. Everything that has happened to me. Every one of my thoughts, good, bad, ugly. Every one of my emotions and affections. You know them intimately. God tenderly and comprehensively knows everything about you. And this is it's not just factual knowledge. This is compassionate knowledge. Like described in Psalm 139. Where we see a God who knows every aspect of your life even at the beginning of conception to the point where He's fashioning your tiny frame in your mother's womb. And even into your, your childhood and your upbringing and in your home. And even right now today, in your current station of life, your career, and all the hardships and things you're going through, and He even is already at the final hours and days that make up the end of your life. If this God knows even the most trivial facts about ravens and lilies and how many hairs you have on your head or don't have on your head, He absolutely knows about your struggles and your anguish and your hardships In fact, He actually knows what is going on inside of you and around you better than you do. When you can't put your finger on it, He can. And David proclaims this truth that God knows everything about him as a means to help comfort his soul. As W.S. Plummer writes, Good men are often made to feel the need of resorting for comfort to the omniscience of God. He knows their path, their past, present, and future. Our safety and solace are in the unlimited vision of God. No enemy can spread a snare for our feet, but it is known to Jehovah. If our wisdom is nonplussed and our reason confounded, it is for the joy that Jehovah understands all mysteries, fathoms all depths, knows all hearts, and controls all causes. When you don't know what's going on inside of you, you can take heart because God knows. God knows you. And to be sure, He also hears you. But not only this, God sees you. God sees you. You see, it's possible for you to hear someone through a phone call, a voice message, or just yelling from the other side of the house, right? We do that all the time at home. Rather than going into someone's presence, let's just shout it out across the house, right? You can also know someone dearly and intimately, but momentarily be removed from their sight due to a work trip, a sickness, whatever it is. They're not there presently with you. But such a prospect is impossible for God. He sees you always, every single moment. You are forever in perfect view of the creator and sustainer of your life. The question is, do you see him? In verse 4, we can see a ramping up of David's theology from the abstract in his head, it's starting to get pushed down and be concrete into his heart. And that will eventually climax in the verse 5 as we'll see. He's already said he's praying to the Lord and that he's before him in his presence, yet look at the way David audaciously speaks to God right here in verse 4. As if he's not aware of the situation. Look to the right and see. There is none who takes notice of me. No refuge remains to me. No one cares for my soul. David's undone as he sits alone in this cave and he's like, hello? Don't you see, God? A 
commentator Alan Ross explains that David's narrowing God's search to his right hand is significant because that's where the defender would be, at the right hand. That's where the, um, his right-hand man, his, his best friend, his shield-bearer, someone would be beside him at all times. But there wasn't anyone there. No person was nearby to provide care or counsel. And likewise, David expresses that there's no place of retreat for him. The word refuge here is better described as a, as a place to, to fly to or flight itself. This is, a, this is bold and demanding language here. It expresses both frustration and anxiety. David is saying, look, Lord, I'm all alone. I need your help. Can't you see my pain? Have you ever felt this way? You have good company with one of the most well-known characters in all of the Bible. In fact, you, you have a lot in common with a bunch of people in the Bible. Some that don't even get as much time in the text. One that I was brought to and found a lot of comfort from looking at her situation is in Genesis 16, there's this woman named Hagar who is Sarai's Egyptian servant. You see, Sarai was jealous. She was angry because Hagar was able to conceive a child for Abram. But Sarai was not. Sarai complained to her husband, and he responded in a passive manner. I don't know, just do whatever you want with her. And this marital argument resulted in Sarai dealing harshly with Hagar and her fleeing into the wilderness where an angel of the Lord speaks with her. Look at Genesis 16. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be a wild donkey of a man and his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly here I have seen him who looks after me. Did you catch the name that Hagar uses here in that last verse to address God? You are a God of seeing. That's El Roy, or Jehovah Roy. You are the God who sees me. Not only that, did you see Ishmael's name? That means God will hear. God listens. The Lord listened to Hagar's affliction and graciously ministered to her soul. He sees her and hears her. He knows her. Which brings us back to Psalm 142. So, so really, David... No one takes notice of you. No one cares for your soul. There's no one who you can flee or find refuge. There's, there's no place of solace. Who are you praying to right this moment? Who is it? Who hears your cries? Who knows your ways? Who sees the absence of your right-hand friend? God does. God sees it. And it's at this moment that a shift starts to happen in David's prayer. He embraces his loneliness as an as an invitation to worship the God who is there, always there. And David begins to, oddly enough, receive loneliness as a gift. As Elizabeth Elliot explains, loneliness is a wilderness, but through receiving it as a gift, accepting it from the hand of God and offering it back to Him with thanksgiving, it may become a pathway to holiness to glory, and to God himself. David realized that God was with him, and he realizes that God's working in him to do something, to make him see that God is all he needs, even in his most lonely of moments. Which brings us to our next big point. God works in us when we are alone. 
God works in us when we are alone. You see, it's not enough for you to realize in your loneliness that God hears, knows, and sees you. He wants you to see, know, and hear Him. It's, it's important for you and me to understand how David's experience of this social isolation works as an invitation for him to press into a greater ultimate reality than the cold, damp cave that he's in. God is working in David when he's alone. He's working to turn the loneliness into an opportunity to worship God and be satisfied in Him. To be satisfied in Him that He's three things. His refuge, His portion, and His salvation. First, His refuge. David continues in verse 5. Let's look at the text. I cry to you, O Lord... I say, you are my refuge. The word he uses for refuge here is different than the previous one. The translation doesn't help us out. It doesn't show a distinction. But what's different about this word is it refers to a shelter. It's like in Psalm 62, 7 through 8. It says, on God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. God is our shelter from danger. He's our place of safety and security in this world full of sin, sickness, violence, and death. And as David hides in this cave from his enemies, he proclaims that he is actually hidden in God from ultimate destruction. And how much greater of an understanding should all of us in this room who are Christians have of that idea of being hidden in God, of of God being our refuge. See, a Christian stands on the other side of the cross. And if you trust in Jesus Christ as your all-sufficient, once-for-all sacrifice for sins, you have been unified with Him, that you have union with Jesus Himself. And Paul's words in Colossians 3.3 can be said of you, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And Christ is your refuge. The Son of David is your shelter from punishment and from the wrath that you deserve for your rebellion against this holy God who was once your enemy but is now your friend. And even when human help may fail you and we find ourselves alone, we can take comfort in the reality that God is our ever-present refuge. He is our refuge. And we can worship Him as such. But not only that, He is our portion. He's our portion. David exclaims to God that He is His portion in the land of the living. The word portion here reminds the reader of the the land inheritance that was given to the families of Israel. Do you remember that? Often the words portion and inheritance, they were coupled together in the Old Testament to speak about the land that was given to all these different tribes. For example, in Numbers 18.20 we read, And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. David was anointed by Samuel to be the king of Israel, the person who was going to rule over all of the land that was inherited by all these tribes of Israel. Judah, but he found himself on the run from Saul. And despite this plight, David just rehearses the truth that God is his portion, not his inheritance, not the land inheritance. And this idea is crucial for us Christians as well. If we focus just on the prosperity of the gospel, it's unhelpful if we do not worship the one behind it. And adore the person who actually gives the good news. Who actually purchases the eternal prosperity that we have in him. This is where the prosperity gospel gets it wrong. See, the good news is not that we get all these things. It is good, but it's not the best news. The best news is that we get God. He is the gospel. He's the good news. We are restored to Him. And we receive Him as our gift, our inheritance, our portion. And we have eternal life with Him 
the Trinitarian God. I mean, just think about this for a second. Think about the Trinity with a moment. I know sometimes we don't always want to do that because that's like mind-boggling and mysterious and, and let's be honest, we can't comprehensively know what's going on there, but you and I need to remind ourselves just how glorious the God of the Bible truly is. You might be thinking, what, what does this have to do with me being lonely or David being lonely? Well, you see, the lonely need a triune God. They need a triune God, not some singular notion of God. The lonely need a triune God or else their isolation will inevitably lead to despair. Why? Well, let's have Michael Reeves explain. Such are the problems with non-triune gods in creation, and salvation for that matter. Single-person gods, having spent eternity alone, are inevitably self-centered beings. And so it becomes hard to see why they would ever cause anything else to exist. Everything changes when it comes to the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Here is a God who is not essentially lonely, but who has been loving for all eternity as the Father has loved the Son and the Spirit. You see that? Loving others is not a strange or novel thing for this God at all. It is at the root of who He is. He loves. He is love. The most valuable part of your inheritance in Christ is not a land, house, streets of gold, perfect help, a wicked, sweet, glorious body, huge sum of riches. It is God Himself, this powerful, loving, and unchanging God who has never been lonely, is the perfect minister for your soul in the midst of your loneliness. Because He doesn't need a refueling of His relational tank in order to love others. It is eternally fuel, and it has been because He has been in eternal communion with Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And thus he has this infinite storehouse of compassion and love to pour out on us sinners who long to be fully known. Psalm 73 says, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In his solitude, David models for us how we ought to view God with our most desperate circumstances. He is our refuge and He is our portion. But not only that, He's our salvation. David continues in verse 6 through 7. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison that I may give thanks to your name. The righteous will surround me, for you deal bountifully with me. In these verses, David uses three imperatives. He says, attend to my cry, deliver me, bring me out of prison. This first one basically just means pay attention. Even though David's vision of God we see is getting bigger now than what it was at the beginning of the prayer, he still maintains its urgency. Why? Because he's still pretty quiet. He's low. He feels like he's been humbled to the ground. His tank is close to empty. Just about everything has been taken out of him and the threats of his enemies are still there. And with his strength and courage just completely and utterly depleted, David calls on God. He calls on God to deliver him from his grave difficulties. His cave life was to him now a a prison life. And this figurative prison it signified a place of extreme limits where he was like hemmed in and like constrained and unable to move. He's pleading, get me out of here. His prison was one that neither he nor anyone else possessed the key to open up except the Lord. He's saying, bring me out. Get me out of here. He's been quarantined from the possibility of true flourishing. It's one of humility. His plea recognizes his inability to deliver himself from the hell that he is in. And it's when we embrace that same posture of complete 
weakness and inability, like David here, that God delights in doing the miraculous. David cannot save himself and neither can we. And that is why this man, after God's own heart, shouts to God his Savior to not forsake him but to deliver him. The New Testament proclaims that God is our salvation because the Son was crushed and forsaken on our behalf. On the cross, you guys remember, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in that moment where Jesus was abandoned by the disciples and was drinking the cup of God's wrath that we deserve for our sin, He saved us. The good news is that Jesus embraced loneliness in His humanity on the cross so that we might never, ever be alone. In fact, the opposite is eternally true. Hebrews 13.5 reminds us that if that God has said to us who are in Christ, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus is our salvation from our enemies, from our sin, from our death, and from our loneliness. Through Christ alone, we're brought out of this prison of death that we deserve for our sin, and we're overwhelmed with thanksgiving for that deliverance. Overwhelmed with praise to the glorious God who saves, the glorious God who is our refuge, who is our portion, and who is our salvation. Thank God that He he sees us, He knows us, He hears us, He's with us, and then He does this work in us to make us see that even when we're alone, we're not actually alone, and He's still worthy of worship. So besides meditating on these words and having them be a balm to your your soul, in any moment where you feel lonely, you can go to this text and meditate on it and remember that you're not alone. What are some other ways that this kind of presses into us? What are some practical applications for this idea that God is with us in our loneliness and He's working in us? I just want to real quickly give you three R's, sort of. (laughs) Repent, rest, and wrap around. See what I did there? Um... Repent, rest, and wrap around. It works. It's alliteration. Um, Cool. First, we need to repent of how we have been complicit in our loneliness and others. The reality is, is we can worship community, connection, fellowship in the place of God. We can desire that more than God himself. But Christ creates the community, right? Right? And sometimes when we get frustrated at others because they're sinners, like us, we might isolate ourselves and contribute to the loneliness that we experience. Proverbs 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. You know, for months of us, we've been living in this age of social distancing, right? With COVID-19. I know, I brought it up again. Ah. But however... The reality is that some of us have been functionally social distancing for years or perhaps decades. We've been reluctant to draw near to others. This may be out of an attempt to preserve our personal comfort or perhaps in an effort to protect ourselves or protect others from ourselves. But we can all too easily see a speck in someone else's eye and that's justification, "Ah, I'm not going to draw near to you. Yeah, it's a little too much, but the reality is is it's the plank in our own eye of our self-righteousness or our self-pity that's keeping us distanced away from people, from friendships, from deep connection, and perpetuates our loneliness. You see, in Genesis 32, Jacob had this pattern of deception and selfishness that eventually led him to be all alone one evening before confronting Esau. And he had to wrestle with God that night. Some of you need to wrestle with God in prayer and ask Him to search you and reveal the ways in which you've been complicit in this. I'm not saying that it's all your fault. But I'm saying that when we react to sin in a sinful way, that just compounds the sin. You need to ask God to reveal in the ways that you maybe have promoted more of a self-absorbed, isolated lifestyle that's begat more loneliness. And confess it to Him. Confess it to those who it's affected. Maybe you need to reconcile. 
restore the relationship that's grown sour. And maybe don't expect it to come like back to what it was in high school or in college or whatever. But make that step. And then confess it to somebody that can keep you accountable with that. Repent of how you've been complicit in your own loneliness and others. Next is rest. Rest in God's abiding presence. Brother Lawrence, you guys heard of Brother Lawrence, right? Some of you? Brother Lawrence used to call this practicing the presence of God. If you're in Christ, you can rest in the truth that God is forever present with you, as we've been talking about through this entire psalm. He's forever present with you, his child. He is your father. When you're sick and unable to spend time with friends, know that God is with you. When you are at work where you may be the only believer on the entire floor, the entire company, you can trust that God is with you. He can strengthen you. And also, because we have a number of parents in our church, and, and parenting is something that I am very passionate about because I've been thrusted into it like a lot of you guys have, and it's a joy and a delight and a duty I want to share a quote from Paul David Tripp about loneliness and parenting. And this still applies to you even if kids are out of the house. If you have grandkids. It doesn't matter if they're in diapers or they're you know, running around or they're in high school or they're in college. Like, I want you to hear the good news of this, this quote. When your father sends you, he goes with you. This means that in every moment when you are parenting, you are being parented. In every moment when you are called to give grace, you are being given grace. In every moment when you are rescuing and protecting your children, you are being rescued and protected. And in every moment when you feel lonely, you are anything but alone because he goes wherever you go. It is impossible for your parenting to ever wander outside the light of his presence. He never forgets you. He never turns his back on you. He never wanders away for a moment. He never favors someone else over you. He never gets mad and refuses to be with you. He never grows cynical. He will never give up and he will never quit. He is tenderly, patiently, faithfully, and eternally with you. You can bank on his care. You can rest in his presence. So rest in God's abiding presence. And then lastly, quickly, wrap around the lonely in your midst. You see, all of Jesus' experiences of quietness and solitude readied him for ministry to others, healing, loving, out of the overflow of his love for the Father, where he met with him and worshipped him in the quiet places. He loved all of his neighbors to the uttermost. The same task is given to us, the church, Psalm 68.6 in the NIV says, God sets the lonely in families. God doesn't just deliver us from our loneliness so that we can, you know, have that dealt with and be to ourselves. The God who calls you his friend through the gospel calls you to befriend others with the gospel. And as we come back to the end of Psalm 142, I know you, some of you are wondering, like, he didn't finish talking about all the verses. We see how David envisioned him being wrapped around by the community of faith once he's been delivered from that cave. You see it? The righteous will surround me, for you will deal bountifully with me. The most beautiful display of this righteous embrace on earth today is the church and the mission that God has given her. The church has been declared righteous by the work of Jesus, and she shows the world they're Christians by the love they have for one another. So go out of your way to show the members of this church that they're not alone. Reach out to them, call, text, meet up with those whom God leads. Dive into a core group. Be in community with one another. Don't seek it out as your like, all-sufficient need because we're going to let you down. But out of the overflow of your love for God. You can, you can take that compassion and you can pour it on the others and they can pour it onto you. And it's this giving, this giving that we, we keep doing to one another and showing the love of Christ to one another. 
your brothers and sisters have been adopted like you into a blood-bought, abundantly loved, and spirit-empowered family. And you have the tremendous blessing and privilege of being with them, just like God is with you. May God give us, all Christians, the, the grace to remember that whenever we feel like we're alone, no one is truly alone. He hears us. He knows us. He sees us. Not only that, may He grant us the eyes to see and treasure Him as our refuge, our portion, and our salvation. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank You that not for a moment will You forsake us because of Christ. That we are never, ever alone. You are present with us. Our deepest pains, our biggest mountaintop experiences, you are there with us. We thank you, Father, for that. We pray that you would help us to see that. Help us to repent of ways in which we've been complicit in promoting loneliness. Help us to rest in your abiding presence. God, help us to wrap around those who are lonely in our midst. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Hebrews 10 reminds us that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but rather we're to meet together in order to encourage each other to love and to good works. We're glad to be able to provide these videos as a means of proclaiming the gospel and encouraging Christians in their walk. However, I want to remind you, this is just a supplement to your Christian life and not meant to replace the local church. So I encourage you, find a Christ-centered Bible preaching church and join yourself to it.